today I'm going to be talking about what your visual system sees where you are not looking. So I want to start out by just reminding you that there's a lot of aspects of vision that are really quite weird. Um, so let's talk about just a few of those, the weird things about vision. The first is that sometimes it's easy to do visual search. So for instance here, I'm going to put up an array and I want you to raise your hand when you see the O. Everybody see it? It's pretty quick, right? And in fact, you probably even noticed that red X and I didn't even tell you to look for it. However, the, the strange thing, that by itself wouldn't be weird, except sometimes search is more difficult. Here I'm going to put up another array and your job is to find the orange square and raise your hand when you see the orange square. That takes a few seconds longer, doesn't it? The, red, the orange triangle and the orange square and the blue square, when you're looking at them, they're, it's perfectly easy to tell them apart, right? I mean, they're very discriminable. Um, and so I'd like to argue that what this is evidence for is that if vision were the same everywhere, this should be easy, but it's not. It's difficult. And so it implies that vision is in some way or another not the same everywhere, okay? Um, a similar kind of conclu conclusion comes from uh, looking at scene perception. Uh, you know, a, a single very short glance suffices to get the gist of a scene. Um, but then when you actually, but the details it turns out are murky and if you prod someone in, uh, experimentally you can find out that those details are murky. And one way that people show this is this phenomenon known as change blindness which is essentially the same as, you know, this kid's puzzle of what's the difference between these two images. Does everyone, see, do people see the difference between the two? Lots or just one? Well, it's sort of one, lots of difference. Yeah. So you see, the, look at the bags of oranges here and the bags of oranges there. Does everyone see the difference now? Is it possible to bring the lights down on the, on the I think, screen? I yeah, I, right, exactly. Oh, now I see it. <laughs> Trust me, it's not just contrast. <laughs> And, and so this is, again, this is this puzzling phenomenon that it seems like your vision is rich everywhere and yet these de details are, are, are murky. And again, I'd like to argue that this is evidence that the vision isn't the same everywhere because once you know where the change is, you, it's certainly quite visible, right? I mean, if you look right at it and everything, you, it, it, it's quite clear what the change is. Um, Okay, so, and bo both of these things, as well as some other uh, aspects of, of vision, have been taken as evidence that there's some kind of an information bottleneck in vision. And the general idea seems to be that, perhaps because there's a limit to what you can sort of shove through the visual system, that you finally encode, the strategy that the visual system uses is that you finally encode stuff, say, where you're, where you're attending and where your fovea is, and then you more coarsely, coarsely encode stuff elsewhere. So it seems like information is somehow degraded where you're not looking. And not looking could mean a number of things. It could mean not foveating, not pointing your eyes at, at, at a place, but it could also mean um, so, something like not attending or perhaps diffusely attending, attending to too much stuff might also make this, this, um, the information be degraded. Okay? Today I'm mostly going to be talking about not foveating, but there's reason to believe that, that this kind of uh, system that I'm going to be talking about also applies to, to the other cases. Um, and, oh, so I should just say, uh, now, this implies that there should be big effects uh, in vision that we need to know about. I mean, if, I want you to think a little bit more about what this means if where you're not looking, things are coarsely encoded. Because if you go to look at a scene, then this is where you're looking, basically, based on, say, that's maybe the size of your fovea, depending on how far you are. And this is where you're not looking. So that's all the stuff that's going to get this coarse encoding. And what's going on there is going to have a big implication uh, for vision. Um, and so, you know, as indicated by that sort of cartoon, um, where you're not looking, say, where your fovea isn't, is a huge fraction of the visual field. By conservative estimates, it's like 99% of your visual field. Um, and where you're not looking is crucial to many uh, tasks. I mean, first of all, how are you ever going to decide where to move your eyes next to get um, more detail if you don't have useful information where you're not looking? Second of all, we know that you can do a lot of things very quickly. You know, I could flash a scene at you 100 milliseconds and you'd know all sorts of stuff about the gist of that scene. So that implies you're, you're getting an awful lot of information out of where you're supposedly not looking. 
Um, and finally, it's also probably very important for a lot of visual cognition problems. Even though we kind of often have a, this toy story that you look in one place and you piece together the information you get from that location with the information you get from another location, in reality, we're not very good at this piecing together of information um, stuff that supposedly happens. And in fact, if all you had was your fovea and you had to make sense of this line drawing that's under here and you've just done three fixations, say, you don't get nearly as much information about what's there than if I really quickly show you the whole darn thing, right? So this, th this uh, representation where you're not looking is hugely important to understanding vision, and, and for that matter, to vision. Now, the, this is an interesting question because also the representation where you're not looking, there's evidence that it's weird. If you think about what you maybe know from even like an intro psych class about um, what about, say, peripheral vision, people talk about there being a loss of acuity, for instance, in peripheral vision, that you're not as good at resolving high spatial frequencies the farther out, the farther out you go in eccentricity. But that's clearly not the whole story, and, and that's, um, that can't explain the change blindness that I showed you. It can't explain the visual search re uh, demo that I just showed you. And perhaps the clearest demonstration of this is from visual crowding, and that's this phenomenon right here. If you look at this uh, plus sign in the middle here, and of course you have one of the main researchers in visual crowding right here in this room, Dennis Levi. Um, if, you, if you look at this plus sign, you probably have no uh, trouble resolving and, and reading the, the G on your left, but you just put some other flankers here, you know, very modestly spaced, and it becomes a lot harder to tell what that central letter is. And just to give you a little bit of a demo that this isn't just due to loss of acuity, you can go ahead and progressively blur this. And you can see that, you know, when you finally blur it enough that you have trouble reading the one in the middle here, you also have trouble reading the one that's, that has no flankers. And for that matter, you can tell that the, the flankers aren't causing, you know, anything to happen to that central letter. So it's not just an acuity loss. There's something weirder going on with crowding. And that's some of what, what we started out trying to understand. Okay. Uh, so this, again, is sort of the big picture for kind of the first half here, if you will. Um, th again, there seems to be this strategy, a lot of people have hypothesized, for dealing with an information bottleneck in vision. You're going to coarsely encode, uh, sorry, finely encode stuff that's where you're looking. You're going to more coarsely encode peripheral and or unattended regions, but hopefully still get as much useful information as possible uh, into higher levels of, of vision. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you to some extent can make up for some errors by the fact that vision is active. If you didn't get enough information, you move your eyes, get more information, and, and so on. Um, and so the, so the question here that we want to ask is, what is this course encoding in, in peripheral vision? Um, so just as a demo, what might you want for this coarser encoding? Let's talk about that. Now, as I mentioned, we already uh, say that there is this known loss of acuity as you go uh, into the periphery. Maybe that's a, a, a good way of, of reducing the amount of information you get through the bottleneck. Um, well, uh, suppose just, just for the sake of demonstration that you have this 280 by 280 image, which you're looking at off in your periphery, and suppose your visual system wants to reduce that to 1,000 numbers. Well, to do that by subsampling and, and you know, doing a loss of acuity version uh, gives you a pretty bad representation of the original, right? You can kind of tell that there were seven things there. You kind of loosely know their size. You don't know they were letters. You, you, know, you, you, you know quite a bit about spatial location, but it's not clear how important that is, frankly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue. Um, and so this doesn't seem like a very good idea as your main way of getting stuff through the bottleneck. Um, you might complain if you're more of a human vision kind of a person, well, you know, pixels, loss of acuity, what's, what's all this? Perhaps you want to do something a little more V1-like before you start shoving things through the bottleneck. So suppose that you, t you do oriented um, filters um, at different and, and multiple scales, and then you reduce it to 1,000 numbers. Uh, well, that... That doesn't obviously solve the problem either. That basically looks, looks much the same. Here I'm using the discrete cosine transform, uh, but if you do something more biologically plausible, it looks very similar, only, only worse. Um, and, uh, but anyway, so that doesn't seem like a good idea either. Um, now we'd like to suggest that instead what happens is, you know, if here's your fixation, that maybe your visual system lays down uh, essentially pooling regions, it, 
a whole bunch of local pooling regions all over the vis visual system, not just these two, and collect some kind of summary information over those pooling regions, like maybe some kind of summary statistics of the responses it got from, from, from really early vision. Um, and if you do this kind of strategy, it turns out you can store basically a whole ton of information in, say, a thousand summary statistics instead of a thousand pixels or a thousand V1 responses. Um, and here, for instance, uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to be talking about the same set of summary statistics. You, the idea is that you first apply something a lot like V1, again, these oriented filters at multiple scales. But that then the summary statistics you collect are things like cross-correlation of responses of those cells, pairwise cross-correlations. So this is useful information. Uh, if you look at whether or not a vertical tends to correlate with another vertical, uh, then that can tell you about things like extended contours. Or it can tell you about something looking a little bit periodic. Right? Uh, if you do uh, cross correlations across orientation, then you start to look for almost like corner like things or T junctions and stuff like that. Um, there's also cross correlations in, in here uh, across scale um, and also phase uh, correlations, which gives you an idea of how sharp edges are and the directionality of edges. Um, there's also a whole bunch of extra stuff like mean luminance and skew uh, of the luminance and stuff like that, to, so that you get sort of the the right colors and gray levels and stuff of, of the image. And these are um, statistics that, that we chose initially because um, Portia and Simoncelli had, uh, in, in the computer graphics, computer vision literature, had hand-tuned, essentially, these um, statistics as being good statistics for um, doing texture synthesis, for, for generating a new texture that looks as much as possible like the original texture that you're trying to, to mimic. Um, and if you... Uh, if you take those thousand numbers, uh, what you, can, you can do that, and you can also take the texture synthesis itself. You can take this original display, and you can ge generate new samples that have approximately the same statistics as the original image. And by doing that, you can get a sense for what kind of information is captured by these summary statistics. Okay? Um, and really, ideally, you should look at more than one of those samples. You know, you wouldn't look at like a single sample and try and guess what the mean of a distribution was. But you can get a pretty good sense from, from looking at the, at the one, what these tend to look like. And so from this 1,000 um, statistical parameters, you can get a whole bunch of how are, yeah, sure, sure. So the regenerate is not us. So just to be clear, it's, this is from Portia and Simicelli. Um, but it's basically, you can start with any image. We're starting with a random noise um, seed. And then you essentially iteratively apply the constraints um, corresponding to those thousand statistics until you get close enough to the original, until you get an image that's close enough to the original, um, uh, the original statistics that you measured. Uh, well, relative, because you're, you're doing cross-correlation. So, so over a fairly big pooling region, you look to see how much uh, verticals tend to be close to horizontals. So there's relative location in the sense that you do care whether or not they're near each other. But, um, but then, you you know, by taking the cross-correlation, you're throwing out all sorts of location information w within the pooling region, of course. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you need the original image to, to get that thousand parameter yeah. model. Yeah. So why can't I just have a seven parameter model where I encode the letters? Uh, because I need the original yes, right. Point, right? So right, right. Uh, yeah, but, but uh, it's a good question. But I think to some extent the argument is that this is an early visual representation. You want it to be general purpose. You want to be able to do lots of stuff with it. And this is all that's going to get through. So you don't want to like, commit to letters being the thing you care about. <laughs> Um, anyhow, you can see that this is pretty useful, especially compared to that low resolution thing it's sitting next to, right? I mean, if you had to just ask yourself whether or not there's any letters in your periphery, you could answer that question pretty well, right? I mean, someone could trick you by doing funny letters, but yeah. So is a hypothesis that uh, the focal region is sort of qualitatively and fundamentally coded a different way, as opposed to just having smaller pooling regions? I think um, to a first approximation, I would say just has smaller pooling regions. Um, there's got to be some discontinuity 
because pooling regions can't go to zero, you know, <laughs> um, but, but, but to a first approximation, I, I, essentially the same kind of thing. I mean, sh this kind of, um, it's worth mentioning that this kind of model that I'm suggesting is uh, not inconsistent with models of sort of ventral stream pathway stuff, like from people like uh, Poggio and stuff like that, where they suggest that you do these uh, co-occurrences of things like horizontal and verticals. And we're just suggesting that as you go more and more peripheral, you get bigger and bigger pooling regions, it looks much more like cross-correlation than it does like co-occurrence. You lose a lot more location information as you go, as you go peripherally. Um, Anyhow, you can look at this. It's not just blobs. You, 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 do, you know that there's letter-like stuff. In some cases, this is a particularly good one. You can even guess some of those letters. Um, you can see whether or not there's diagonals and certain kinds of junctions you can make guesses about. It, again, depends on what's in the stimulus, what kinds of information you can get out. But it looks pretty good. And the main cost, again, is that is some location information. Some, uh, some structures are being moved around. You don't know exactly where they are and stuff, and stuff like that. I mean, you know, you can just see there, there wasn't really an X there is kind of the, the extreme version, right? Um, so this is, this is the proposal, is that we're doing this kind of thing. So it seems like it might encode useful information to do something like this. Uh, it's also been a lot of work in vision suggesting that some visual tasks simply are inherently statistical tasks. And you can imagine that this information would be useful for that as well. So, um, you know, pre-attentive texture segmentation, texture discrimination is kind of an obvious one, but a lot of people have said that's a statistical kind of thing. Um, I've been arguing for some time that your visual system in deciding what is interesting and might draw your attention might be essentially like a test for outliers that your visual system is doing. That also w is consistent with this. Um, various people recently have suggested that deciding whether or not a, a material is shiny might have to do with looking at, at things like subband skew. Um, and furthermore, people can actually do conscious estimates of set properties like mean size and stuff like that, which these folks have argued you know, is a good thing for survival. If you want to judge whether or not there's better berries over there or over there, you want to look at like the mean size you're getting out of the two, the two sets. So there's all sorts of good you know, hints that this is not probably a good idea is to, to collect some statistics if you're, if you're stuck with some reduced representation. Um, okay, so the big question is, you know, this is all just sort of speculative at this point. It seems like maybe it's a good idea. Is there actually any evidence that this is what people, what people do? And if so, what are the implications for vision? You have a question? My question was just, um, if you really uh, are thinking of such a larger pooling region where you do cross correlations, you would predict these kind of ghost images that you actually did see in this sample drawn from Simoncelli. So that tells you know it's some periodic distances you see an X that was never there. Um, uh, Yes, yeah, so uh, as I'm going to get to in just a minute, these regions probably kind of overlap, which re reduces some of that sort of random BS happening, but, but yeah. Uh, yeah, if you really didn't know this, the, the if you really only knew the statistics for one patch, you could potentially do all sorts of sorts of weird stuff. Yeah. Do you get free floating um, features that, you know, like a, a V has to? Right. Uh, <coughs> to some extent, you'll you'll see some a lot of examples later, which I think will answer that question. Uh, when we talk about search, you'll you'll see you'll see some of that. Um, the uh, okay. All right, so uh, what summary statistics? Again, I'm going to use this set I'm already talking about. I just want to make the point here, you know, for this to be a useful representation, that argument hinged on there being a lot of numbers here. And so we are not talking about just something like mean orientation, mean size, blah, blah, blah. I mean, first of all, uh, when people talk about set perception, they're really talking about statistics of things, and I'm really talking about statistics of stuff, like filter outputs. Um, but, you know, a few numbers just isn't enough. We're, again, talking about like a thousand numbers. And one of the challenges here is that it's hard to picture what in the world that means, uh, having so many numbers. But we're going to give you some tools. Um, okay. And again, the, I, you know, I said these already. These are the statistics we're using by and large. Um, some hints even before we came into the picture and, and some afterwards that these are a good set. First of all, they're close to sufficient meaning uh, if you use this full set of statistics and you ask people to do texture discrimination, discriminating between a synthetic texture and an original in the, in the periphery, uh, people are quite bad at it. So, so you haven't thrown out 
too, too much information. Similarly, uh, Jeremy Freeman and Aero Simoncelli have done some work where they do um, uh, real scene perception, and again show that if you're using all these statistics um, to represent the scene in a, in a way very similar to what I'll show you later, that people have a very hard time telling the difference between a synthesized scene and the, and the original scene. So again, that's, that, that isn't a proof that they're the right ones, but it is very suggestive that it's sufficient. Um, and furthermore, my colleague Ben Ballas has suggested that a significant subset of these, at least, are, are almost certainly necessary. If you do remove them, people very quickly notice that, that something's missing. Um, okay, so that's my... We can talk more about how one tests what statistics at, uh, after the talk or something like that, but that's my, my argument for now about why this is a good guess. Uh, okay, so is there evidence for this? And like I say, we started out looking at crowding, so this is the first thing we want to try and, and predict. And certainly there were hints in the literature before we came along that this might be what was going on. Um, the loss of location information, people often in these crowding displays report the wrong letter in an array. That, that had been taken as perhaps evidence that people were doing something kind of statistical. People subjectively report features of uh, multiple items being kind of jumbled together. That's certainly something we would predict if you look at some of these synthesis these A's and B's are being kind of joined together and stuff like that. And, um, you know, a number of people, uh, this is a quote from Dennis Pelly, but a number of people had been suggesting that perhaps um, what was happening was somehow features were being integrated over too big of a region, which again to us sounds like something sort of statistical happening. Um, furthermore, there's these folks, Parks et al. had given people a peripheral test where you had a bunch of Gabor's oriented. Um, and, and a number of different orientations, and they ask you to say whether the tilt of any tilted ones is up or down, and the, uh, found that people uh, behaved, the, the data points are, are the things with error bars, found people behaved very much as if they were making the judgment based on the average orientation, which again was this hint that maybe some statistical stuff is going on. So these are all the, the green curves are the predictions of making judgments based on the average. Um, not quite the sort of thing we're talking about, but still was suggestive. Um, so if you are integrating over an excessively large region, what is that region? And again, the crowding people had also um, very nicely supplied us with a, a good guess as to what this region uh, was. There's a thing that's been referred to as Boma's Law, uh, which suggests that if you, it, it, for the K and P, the flankers, to, to make it hard to recognize the G, that those flankers have to be within first approximation, about half the eccentricity of the letter you're trying to, or the symbol you're trying to recognize. So, and this seems, by and large, to be not dependent upon the stimulus. It seems to just be the region over which you pool stuff, is our interpretation. Um, so that's nice, because that essentially suggests um, uh, what these pooling regions should be. So, so, you know, somewhat cartoony, but we're essentially assuming that if you're looking there at the plus sign, that you're going to lay down a bunch of presumably overlapping pooling regions that tile the visual field um, and, uh, and that grow linearly with eccentricity, as suggested before. And this combination of the summary statistics we're hypothesizing plus the overlapping pooling regions, we're now calling the texture tiling model because we get tired of saying all those other words. Um, Okay, so can this representation predict crowded letter recognition? Um, well, first you've got to run a bunch of crowding tasks and just to get a, you know, a range of performance so you have something for your model to try and predict. We have nine conditions here. Here's the first five. They're ranked in order from the easiest ones to the most difficult. There's five of them. There's another four. And in each of these cases, there's four possible targets in the center. Uh, and a number of different kinds of things for, for flankers, either other letters or lines, squiggles, toasters, things like that. Um, and, so, and again, the, the subject's task is always to recognize that central, that central item. Um, so how do we actually test the model? Now, this is the tricky part, because again, those thousand numbers are hard to, to think about. Um, and what you really want to know is how in, sort of inherently difficult is it to do these tasks? if what you've got available is those summary statistics, okay? And so what you can imagine doing is taking a bunch of the images that where the target is, is an F and grouping those together, taking a bunch where it's an E and a bunch where it's an L, a bunch where it's a T, the four possible targets. And then you can imagine for each of those images um, and thus for each of those sets, measuring the statistics and essentially asking how 
um, how discriminable are those four different sets of, of statistics and seeing whether or not that predicts crowding performance, okay? And um, that is stated as a perfectly reasonable idea. The tricky thing here, though, is that this is inherently really a pattern recognition pro uh, problem, I would argue. And of course, the best pattern recognizers are people still, not computer vision systems. And so we'd really like to get a person into this loop so that they can essentially tell us how discriminable they are. And so the trick is that we once again go back to the texture synthesis roots of this whole thing. And now for each of these original images, we're going to generate a number of these synthesized images that again have approximately the same uh, summary statistics as the original. Okay, and we call these mongrels. So we do that for each of the four sets. And then you can actually have people look at them. And the people can try and tell you, oh yeah, you know, I, I, I think that one originally had an F target and that one originally had an E target and so on. And we can get at this measure of how discriminable those four sets are. Okay? And so then the full picture looks something like this. You have a bunch of images. You have one set of observers uh, down here doing these crowding tasks. They're looking at these things in the periphery and being asked uh, which of the four targets is present. Those guys are looking, in this case, they were looking at 14 degrees eccentricity for 300 milliseconds. We were monitoring their fixations to make sure they weren't cheating. Um, and, and so that's sort of that half. The second half, you take the same images, you do texture synthesis, you get a bunch of mongrels. Uh, and then an observer is just going to look at those stimuli for as long as they want. In this case, they actually had them on cards, and they're sorting them into four piles according to uh, w w which category they think they, that they came from. Um, and we let them look fovially, we let them look for as long as they want because sort of they're being almost our ideal observer here. We want to know what performance is possible with the summary statistics. And as a result, we, we want them to get every benefit. We want them to do the absolute best that they can. Um, now you might ask, what in the world do we tell these subjects <laughs> since they're looking at these very weird images? And, and that is not obvious. Um, uh, as we do more and more complicated uh, stimuli, this becomes more of an issue. Um, but anyway, we, they see examples of the original stimuli, so they know what the real flankers looked like. They know what the possible targets looked like. They're told what the target choices were. They are told that the images were munged up somehow um, and that the target no longer is, is almost certainly not in the center anymore. It could be anywhere. The target may not be a single thing. They might just see features of the target in several places. Um, you, you know, may not look like the original target and so on. And again, they sort them into piles. And we look at how well they do for each of these conditions at, at doing that sorting. Uh, and the idea is that if, if over a range of conditions, the performance from doing the peripheral task is similar to the performance um, that you get do, operating on the summary statistics, then that argues that you've captured something about the information that's available to the visual system. Okay? Yeah. So in the, in the task along the bottom, yeah. the, the observers see the stimuli in the periphery. So how would they get the statistics that you are using at the top? Because they're only seeing the sort of blurry, they never see the original ones. Ah, right, right, right. The, the signature. Uh, well, so one thing I should mention is that before we do the, the mongrels, we are actually blurring an appropriate amount for the um, periphery. So that's, that's what accounts for the peripheral blur. But then, you know, the blur is very modest, at, even at 14 degrees eccentricity. It's not a big effect. Um, and the, uh, so, so, you know, these guys are doing the best they can with the statistics their visual system is measuring on the slightly blurry image. These guys are doing their best with the statistics that we, you know, we measured on the blurry image. Yes, I, I'm not sure literally for this figure, but in, sorry, in, the, in the experiment, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what kind of feedback or training did the subjects get when uh, determining what the correct answer is for the mongrel images? In this particular case, we were, this is early in our, <laughs> in our attempting to do this. They're not getting feedback, but they do get to see their piles, essentially. They're, they're seeing all of them at once, which seemed to be a, a reasonable substitute. In later experiments, when I talk about search and stuff like that, people are getting, they're getting training at the beginning. They get feedback on every trial about whether they got it right. Um, we, we didn't do it in this case, but, but it's, it seemed to be that get, just getting to see essentially as many of the cards at once as they wanted to was providing a lot of that, uh, a lot of that, that, that result. Yeah. So if both subjects have the same performance, that tells you that your summary statistics are maybe sufficient for the task. 
but my brain could maybe be solving it with some very small subset. Oh, sure. That's sufficient information. And so I'm not sure how this experiment tells me that your model necessarily is what my brain is doing. So your brain to do a particular task is almost certainly using a subset. But if you, <laughs> the idea is that if you could have a wide enough range of conditions, then, then you can actually do the both necessary and sufficient. Now, whether nine crowding experiments is wide enough is, is another issue. But, you know, if you do badly when the model says you do badly, you do well when the model says you do well, then at some point you, 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 it's more than just sufficient that you're getting out of it. Yeah? Do you, like, give them 12 cards and tell them to break it into four groups of three, or do they not know? They don't know how many per. Yeah. You know, who knows if they're guessing something about that, but... Okay, so if you act, we, we did this, and if you look at it, the sorting performance, which is here, is actually quite predictive of the per peripheral um, performance. Each one of these squares is one, is one condition, color-coded um, by, the, by the diagrams over here. And uh, you know, R squared is about 0.65, but the mean R squared between subjects on crowding is 0.74, so there's a limit to how, how good it could possibly be. And the slope is pretty darn close to 1, too. I mean, this, it's not merely correlated. It's really quite predictive of the peripheral performance. Uh, okay, so that's, that's some evidence that this might be uh, what's going on. You might also ask, since we started with crowding being about um, uh, flankers versus no flankers, uh, can you predict the lack of crowding when you don't have flankers? And basically, yes. These are the mongrels for a simple item uh, that's isolated. Uh, you, you, you predict that you can probably pretty easily recognize it. So it's nice because you don't need some sort of crowding module that somehow turns on because, it, because there's flankers, right? Um, all right. I feel like I'm behind. Let me sort of skip ahead a little. Uh, okay, so you'd imagine there'd be implications of this for other parts of vision too. And so what about visual search? Let's take a stab at that. And again, there's about 30 years of results on visual search and, and uh, arguably still kind of puzzling. And the main puzzle, I would say, is that even if you essentially hold constant the discriminability between the target and the distractors, um, the target you're looking for and the distractors, the other items in the display, you still get big differences in performance. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, loosely speaking, feature search, where one feature determines the target, is easier than conjunction search, where you have to sort of combine two features, orientation and luminance. And that configuration search is still, is still harder. Uh, furthermore, I mean, the most damning, damning evidence against it being search being about target distractor differences is that there's asymmetries all over the place. Searching for a Q among O's is a lot easier than searching for an O among Q's. And, and why does that happen? Um, uh, and we, you know, are suggesting that, of course, peripheral vision must be important for search because if something pops out, it, it, the whole point is that you noticed it without, without uh, looking right at it. And furthermore, search is going to be really hard if you don't have peripheral vision to guide your, your eye movements to the target. Um, so how do we rethink search given what we're thinking about crowding? Um, and if you're looking at a particular fixation, like with the cross there, uh, uh, these are the same pooling regions I drew before, doing circles just for simplicity. Um, you know, one of the pooling regions you put down probably lands on a bunch of items. Um, this is not, one of the things we're trying to argue is that search is not about individual items. The task to the visual system is to decide whether or not you've got a big patch containing multiple distractors versus having a big patch containing a target and multiple distractors. And again, we would argue that it has to make this decision based on the summary statistics of those two, of those two patches. Uh, okay, so we're going to say, can this, can this predict uh, search results? Um, so we re-ran five really classic uh, search conditions, re-ran them just so they have the same subjects and the same displays and, and stuff like that. Um, we eye tracked, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and we get search results here. I'm showing you mean reaction time to find the target versus the number of display items or the set size. This is just for correct target present trials, um, which is mostly what we're going to try and try and model. And you'll notice also I've marked off here the slopes of, of these lines, which is a common measure of uh, search, uh, search performance. And these are very similar to the results in the literature. Um, 
And the same kind of, we're going to do the same sort of thing again. We're going to show, we're going to take patches, in this case, that have either target present or, or distractor only. We're going to mongrelize them and ask people to guess which one they were originally. And I'm going to let you be sort of a mini subject here. The subjects really see one at a time. They get feedback, blah, blah, blah. But you're going to get to see some examples and, and see what it's like. So here is a feature search should be easy. You're looking for a tilted um, line among verticals. And here's what the mongrels look like. OK, this versus this. I think you'll agree it's pretty darn easy to tell those two sets apart. You got, you got a tilted line in all the target present ones. You don't have it in any of the target absent. Um, T among L should be relatively difficult. The T's and L's can be any orientation, blah, blah, blah. Um, and here's what that looks like. So certainly there's some things that make this pretty hard, right? I mean, you got, for instance, if you're actually literally looking for a T, which may not be the only way to tell these apart, there's some target present mongrels where there's like no, nothing that looks like a T, and there's some really nice T's in the target absent case, right? It's like an illusory configuration or whatever. So that should be pretty hard, and in fact, our subjects find that quite difficult. Uh, here's a fun one. Uh, looking for a white vertical among white horizontals and black verticals. Um, and here's the target present and target absent. Um, so those look a little bit hard to do, too. Not as bad as, as the T among L, as it turns out. Um, and the fun part, I think, is that you actually get these like illusory conjunctions, these white verticals in the target absent that weren't in the original display. And this is, this is important because one of the main sort of things you've got to predict if you're going to convince search people that you have a real model of search is illusory conjunctions. And here they just sort of pop out of the statistics we picked for completely other reasons. No, wait, wait, wait. So my understanding is that these are synthesized images from these statistics. So right. These conjunctions only actually are there once you've done the synthesis, right? Yeah, so, so we're, not, what, we're not necessarily suggesting that the visual system does the synthesis or anything, but we are at the very right. least suggesting that there's an ambiguity in the statistics about whether or not these target absent things had a white vertical, okay. right? And based on that ambiguity, somehow your visual system might say, you know, if someone forces you to, you might guess that there was a, a white vertical. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can do the other ones. O among Q should be difficult. Um, and our subjects really pull out their hair on this, this task, basically. <laughs> this, is a really, this ends up being a really weird an exper experiment as an aside, be the whole thing, because some of the tasks people are at ceiling, and some of them, they really, really hate us. Um, Q among O should be easy. And this is not as easy as the tilted among vertical, but there's definitely some um, Q-like things floating around in the target present that make this possible. Yeah. Uh, if anything, probably in some cases it would predict that it gets easier because there, if there's not crowding, then then things should you know be better. And uh, there's kind of mixed results about that. Um, it definitely uh, there have been people at, not not in our lab who have who have shown that you know uncrowding the displays makes a difference. But it's also uh, definitely true that that there. You can do a search display that, by the standard definitions of crowding, is uncrowded, and people will still have some of, some of this effect. It's some of the suggestion that um, perhaps attention also, perhaps inattention also blows up the pooling regions, and that might need to be a more an extra component that gets added at some point. Um, OK, so if you do all this, I'm plotting it sort of differently. But basically, this axis is how good do you do doing the task with the summary statistics. And this axis is how good do you do on search. And again, it's a nice, uh, a nice fit. So suggestions that you can do the search uh, stuff. Uh, I kind of want to get to, I have like 12 minutes more. <laughs> we'll see what I can do. Uh, OK. Uh, you can, another thing that's kind of cool here is you can actually even more quantitatively try and predict search, which has really not been done for this kind of search display, to try and predict reaction time and number of fixations and stuff. Um, and the, you know, the simple version is just to flesh out the model a little bit more. You, know, you start at some fixation, you lay down pooling regions. Based on those pooling regions, you, some of the items are simply resolved. You can, if they're simple items, like for typical search displays, you just know whether or not they're target or distractor. Those are the green ones. Apologies to colorblind people. Um, and other, other pooling regions, the red ones, they're just they're crowded. And so you can't tell what's there. 
So then based on that, you go to one of the items, if, assuming you didn't already see the target, you go to one of the items that um, you don't know about, you lay down the pooling regions again. Oh, look, I can tell, you know, that, that target wasn't crowded. I know it's there. And, and you know, I can, you continue until you find the target. And based on this, you can, t you can essentially, I'm not going to go into the details, uh, but you can take this information we're hypothesizing is available in the, in the periphery and that, in fact, we've measured in the previous experiment, um, you know, this sort of statistical D prime, just one, one sec. Um, and you can do sort of an ideal observer model for where someone should move their eyes next, try and predict the number of fixations, and, and see whether or not that matches what people actually do. Yeah? Not. Um, and so, so predicting for these kinds of search displays, unless you intentionally fiddle with the displays to encourage people to look a certain way, um, unless it's like an easy search, like tilt among vertical or something, um, people are pretty variable. And, the, uh, and in fact, you know, the model predicts that. I mean, there's, no, there's not a lot of suggestion you should go one place versus another. Um, but you can nonetheless predict sort of these, these um, statistics of the fixations and stuff. That's, that's easier. We've just recently done some stuff showing there's, you, you, can, uh, you can reduce your ambition and you can do a certain amount of predicting of patterns. Like you can analyze each display and say, oh, the left is much better direction to go than the right. And in fact, people will do that. Um, but, but to really say where they'll look next, is, is, that's hard. For real scenes and stuff like that, there's a lot more guidance, right? There's a lot more reason to look in one particular place. For these, you know, you've intentionally created search displays where it's pretty random. <laughs> so there's just not a lot of information to make people be consistent. Um, okay, so you do this. Uh, it involves you have to do a lot of math to figure out what the ideal observer says. So you do a lot of math, <laughs> and you do a lot more math, and eventually it kind of comes down to this. So you're going to make... We're going to do a Monte Carlo simulation here, right? So a Monte Carlo simulation uh, is going to try and mimic the human by making a noisy observation from each pooling region. That's that right there. It's going to normalize it by subtracting d prime over 2 and scaling by d prime. This is like this measure of discriminability that I've been talking about throughout. Uh, that, that'll make a little more sense in a minute. And then essentially, if you're trying to decide between i or j for your next fixation, you look at i, you look at all the pooling regions that overlap i, and you sum up that normalized observation for that. And you do the same thing for j, you sum up all, all of those, and whichever place in the image has the highest normalized sum of normalized observations is the one you go to next. You run this a whole bunch of times in, in your Monte Carlo simulation, and you try and predict mean number of fixations. Um, where do you get the d prime? Uh, it, there's two different stories depending on whether or not a patch is crowded or not. If it's crowded, you take it from the experiments I showed you just before. Uh, if it's not crowded, then you want to be a lot better at knowing whether it's a target or a distractor, but maybe you're not 100%. We take the D prime from the easiest search condition for, the, for those cases. And so this has, in your simulation, you're drawing an observation from this distribution if the patch really does have a target. You're drawing an observation from this distribution if it, if it doesn't. That's the, 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 the key here. Um, so I'm going a little fast in this part. If you do this, the actual number of fixations that people do on average are represented by the squares. Um, the predictions of the model uh, with, with uh, no memory, meaning you only use this current instant of time to decide where to go, uh, are shown by the solid lines. And the shaded regions are kind of the confidence intervals on the model predictions. And you can see it looks pretty good. I'll show you them separately just so you can get a sort of a better idea. It, it, it's doing a pretty good job. Um, for that matter, you can then say, well, I don't want a number of fixations. Let's see if I can predict reaction time. For that, you really need to find sort of the best fit number of milliseconds per fixation to map onto a reaction time. You do that, you get nice predictions of reaction time, and you get about 180 milliseconds per fixation, which is a perfectly reasonable guess for milliseconds per fixation. You know, that's, that's the kind of numbers that people find. Um, so that looks pretty cool. Uh, so we're arguing again that, that the, one of the key important things here is that you have to think about search, the task for the visual system in search as being to discriminate between these patches with multiple items in them. That's, that's really the, the big key thing. And that those patches are represented by these summary statistics. 
uh, if you do that, you, this sort of mongrel discriminability is predictive of how well people do on, on search for these five classic conditions. We're currently increasing this. We're running like another 25 conditions <laughs> trying to figure out what happens. Uh, and furthermore, you can do, take this same sort of idea, you can develop an ideal observer model, actually make quantitative predictions for really the first time on these kind of displays of number fixations and reaction time in order to, to find the target. And that, that all works out well. And the and particularly interesting thing here is there, you know, other than the fact that we have picked this set of summary statistics, there is no, you know, part of the model that says, oh, this is feature search, so I've got to do something different than you know, oh, this is configuration search, oh, this is conjunction search, I, I got to have a different component in the model. That's all just ca encapsulated by the summary statistics. It's not, there's no special, special difference between them. Okay. Alrighty. So this is all the sort of, you know, the experiment's already run, so now I'm getting a little speculative. But you imagine that this kind of representation would have implications all over the place in vision, right? We're talking about a representation where you get a lot of useful information in your periphery, but it's a little weird because you're jumbling up some of the details and, and you're losing a little bit of location information and you know, you're generating illusory conjunctions and all kinds of stuff like that, right? So you'd imagine there'd be implications all over the place, right? Um, and to try and get at this, we want to be able to make predictions uh, for complex displays. And to do this, we do something like the following. Suppose this is your image. You first pick a fixation. Here, the fixation's right about there. And we're going to try and synthesize sort of a full field mongrel. What, do you, what is the information available in the whole darn image with these overlapping pooling regions that we're talking about? So we're just going to pretend the fovea is pretty much accurate. So we're just going to copy that over there. And then we're going to th uh, go through and find a pooling region, extract the statistics, synthesize a new version where the seed now is not merely random noise, but you actually know this little piece that it overlaps with in the, in the fovea. You know whatever was there before. You're going to do the next uh, pooling region, and it, now it knows about, again, not just the fovea, but the previous region. You're going to keep doing this, do a whole bunch of other pooling regions, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we do this iteratively. It is not a fast process. Um, <laughs> and it's course defined, which makes it a little bit faster, but still. And it, by no means is it perfect. We're definitely still getting some artifacts and stuff. But it's good enough to get um, some indication of the predicted information available, even in these complex scenes. Okay. So in this case, for instance, it looks like that. And if anyone's interested, I can show you comparison of different subway maps later on. Um, <laughs> But anyway, that's another topic. This is what I'm talking about at SPIE. Uh, and you might ask about, for instance, natural scenes, uh, right? Because this is some of the puzzle, again, is that, um, you know, I mentioned with the change blindness that you get, uh, you feel like you've got this rich representation of the scene. You can do gist really fast. But on the other hand, you're not all that aware of some of the details. And, and if someone changes one, you, you often can't tell, right? So here, in this case, uh, for sort of, reasons I won't go into, we're pretending that the fixation's up in the corner. A lot of people run these tests a little bit peripheral. And we're going to do the same kind of synthesis. And th these are images often used for something like an animal, no animal task, which is one of the, the many tasks that people are very good at. You can do it in like 100 milliseconds or less. So you clearly have not moved your eyes. You've just got one fixation and, and you can still do it quite well. And this is the kind of synthesis that, that you get. And, and I think that you can see that, first of all, clearly some of the details are just flat out wrong, right? I mean, the grass is all messy and stuff like that. And the flowers, if you look at them carefully, they aren't in the right place and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, you would probably say that was outdoors, right? And, you know, it's a grassy thing and pretty clearly as an animal, right? I mean, someone maybe fooled you, but it has something that looks a darn lot like an animal. Um, you might be a little uncertain what kind of animal, but you're pretty good at telling there's an animal. You certainly don't know the exact pose that the animal is in, right? There's lots of stuff you don't quite, quite know. Um, but, you know, that looks like flowers. You know, there's a lot of stuff you should be able to do with this. Um, you know, one needs to do a really careful study of whether what you can do with this representation maps on well to what people can really do, but it's intriguing. Um, I think this is another thing that is, has interested me for a while. I occasionally do stuff with vision and car companies and stuff like that. And uh, you're perhaps not aware of it while you're driving, but actually for long stretches of driving, you pretty much are looking at the car in front of you. You're not really moving your eyes very much. 
And uh, so, you know, so, so if you've got some weird representation in vision, how are you driving? I mean, for that matter, let's face it, half the time you're not paying attention. Um, <laughs> so how are you managing to drive? How are you managing to stay on the road? How are you managing not hit anybody and stuff like that? Well, again, you can do these syntheses. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you see sort of artifacty, um, but, you know, you can tell a stop sign's coming up, this predicts, right? You can kind of tell where the road is. You can tell there's a car oncoming, uh, even if you don't know the exact details of it. You could, I'd argue you can tell there's snow here and there's trees on the side of the road. The road is wet because you can see the sort of reflection of the lights uh, in the road and stuff like that. Uh, you know, but again, the exact details aren't, aren't right. You know, the windows aren't in the right place in the house and the, and, and, and the various things aren't in the right locations if you, look, if you look carefully. But you could probably drive with this representation. Okay. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, in conclusion, I just want to sort of emphasize again that uh, in addition to uh, this being, I hope you'll agree, an interesting model, of this early representation in, in vision. Um, there's also, I, I want to sort of explicitly say there's, there's a useful thing about the methodology that I'm showing you. Um, thinking about these thousand numbers, these thousand summary statistics is extremely difficult for anybody. Um, but the cool thing is that these syntheses allow you to sort of visualize the, the information encoded in the, in the statistics. to let you sort of see the inherent ambiguities or confusions, the, uh, the, the ambiguities and confusions that are inherent to this representation. Um, and that, in turn, is really cool because it lets you to study the effects of what is effectively a low-level visual representation that we're talking about here on higher level vision uh, without actually understanding higher level vision, which is, is the cool part, right? Um, and so uh, in conclusion, we're suggesting here that summary statistics may be a really useful way for the visual system to basically shove as much useful information as it can through what seems to be a bottleneck in vision. Um, that a model based on this with a, with a certain set of summary statistics and this notion that you pool over progressively bigger regions as you go in the periphery can predict uh, these weird effects of essentially losing uh, information and having trouble doing crowded letter recognition that can pr provide a coherent explanation of a, a bunch of uh, visual search uh, results, uh, both of which suggesting that, that, that maybe this is a good, uh, a good explanation of, 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 this, of what's going on in vision. Um, and in addition, I sort of wanted to give you a hint that, you know, it's also conceivable that this underlies a lot of other stuff. The kinds of rich representation you get of scenes while being uh, not aware of the, of the details. Um, you know, you might also look at all sorts of things, illusions, uh, classic visual cognition sort of phenomena about what, where it's sometimes easy to tell that two points are on the same line and sometimes very hard to tell that two points are on the same line and stuff like that. And the, the sort of ambitious hypothesis, if, if, if you will, is that this, um, this weird sort of quirky representation uh, might be the key determinant of an awful lot of visual performance, that you lose this information early on, and then the visual system might pretty much do the best it can with the information it's got. And so you might be able to, to, to it might be true that one mechanism really underlies a, a very wide range of visual phenomena. And uh, sort of regardless of whether or not this turns out to be true, there's a lot of work to be done to test whether or not it's true, uh, but these, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of interesting projects to be done. <laughs> that I want, I'm hoping to convince other people to also do these projects. And the, 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 regardless of whether or not this hypothesis turns out to be true, it's completely testable, thanks to these, the, me the, the methodology that, that, I'm, that we're developing and that I'm showing you. Thanks. So I'm wondering whether there's, uh, you thought at all about maybe the, the temporal dynamics of this kind of system, in particular, you know, if you're fixated someplace and you've got these pooling regions, if you stay fixated there, do the size of the pooling regions get smaller over time? And I'm wondering for a particular reason in your driving example, this is just totally off the yeah. wall of my own yeah. like intuition. When I 
fixate on a license plate of a car in front of me, it's like 80% of the time, it's, you know, one that's got uh, letters that mean something. Oh. Right? <laughs> that wouldn't be possible in this model. It doesn't, and, and I'm trying to figure out, well, maybe it's because I've got enough time that there's some shrinkage in the size of the uh, tilings or something that would give me better information, and then I could do pattern recognition on what. We, uh, we, 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 we certainly have uh, thought about that to some extent. Dennis can probably comment uh, as well. I think th there have been some limited experiments in the crowding literature on whether or not having more time matters. And uh, by and large, I th my understanding is it has a pretty minimal effect. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree? Is it, uh, well, mostly without there's some weird results. <clears throat> Patrick Cavanaugh and right. Srimon Tripathi actually found a change in this, some shrinkage with time that yeah. wasn't, you know, they, they never had an explanation. Right. And, and again, there certainly are various suggestions that, you know, getting time to focus your attention or something to that effect is, it's usually attributed to attention, could have some, of, mm -hmm. some effect. It's probably fairly modest. Mm -hmm. um, we're also, we're interested in, there's, just speaking of Patrick Cavanaugh, there's tons of, uh, temporal crowding kinds of things, which almost certainly sort of speak to this, and that are, would be interesting to model as as their own in their own right. Yeah. So, have you tried um, taking the thousand-dimensional representation and feeding that into your favorite classifier to see if you can do discrimination? So, not working on the actual synthesis. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we did that for crowding, and you certainly can, uh, you know, make some assumptions about your classifier and get yeah, it so to I'm do not, the right predictions. I with that, <laughs> right, think right. Classifier yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, so you have to do several things. I mean, you know, frankly, the, the part of the problem is that your your favorite linear classifier is going to do great, meaning not predict the results, but say that it's all easy, because thousand dimensional space, everything is not near anything, and you know, it, so. But but of course, the visual system can't possibly do that well. I mean, the, the visual system can't really tell that orientation from that other orientation, and you've got to plug that in and stuff. So um, it, it definitely, we're hopeful that someday this will turn into machine classification what and is it you're trying not to showing stuff. With your classifier? I'm just, so there's the whole synthesis part of this, right? Which mm -hmm. is you extract statistics, and then you have to actually synthesize with each other random noise, and you have this iterative algorithm. Right, right. And that part is not biologically plausible, although the extraction of the statistics are. So I'm just right, going to right. operate in a raw, thousand-dimensional system. It seems like what you want to predict is you want to see if you can predict the sorting behavior of, of the... Right, or, of the, or the crowding behavior, right? Yeah, but on the, on the actual summary statistic representation. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the thing that we did that does, uh, you know, sort of seem promising at least is... You know, we reduce the dimensionality, first of all, because otherwise there's just no hope. And, um, and we don't so much say, you know, discriminable or not, but we measure the distance between, you know, whatever. And it, and it does a pretty good job. I think there's a plot in the 2009 paper that, that has that. So it certainly looks hopeful, but it's, we're reluctant to spend too much time with that right now. Yeah. But, but one reason why that proposal might be more useful is it's clearly the statistics that you have don't allow you to make a unique image, because mm -hmm. you started with one image, right, right. with the same statistics, you get this other funky one. Mm -hmm. yeah. But presumably, I have a pretty strong prior about what images <laughs> look like that I've actually seen, and they don't look like these funny, messed up things. Yeah, so although... I'm acting on the raw summary statistics, yeah. that prior I might be able to do much better than... I would certainly a priori agree with your statement about the prior, except try mm. introspecting sometime on what you see in peripheral vision, and it's pretty <laughs> funky. <laughs> you know, you know they're people, you're, they still look pretty funky. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, yeah. Um, with um, cloudy, it was just a, a larger question. Um, has there been work done on when you, when you introduce perspective in 3D elements and how that affects crowding phenomena? Uh, crowding per se, I'm not sure, but there's if you want to take search as studying crowding, then yes. Uh, but that's like you know a bunch of little cubes or something like that, or, or you know we haven't really looked at. There's some stuff where it's on a ground plane, we haven't looked at that at, at, as much. Um, there's some lighting stuff also. Yeah. Up the yeah. Kind of right. Uh, so. It, the, the story is still sort of o open there. I think we can talk about some details independently. That might be the best thing to do. Yeah. Have you thought about showing more than one sample from the model? We we do, we do. Yeah. So so in case it wasn't clear, you know, 
for each image, we show people at least 10, probably more in many cases, samples. So, so you, it's not that subject to the whims of the algorithm to spit out a particular image. You know, any particular image like has a T in it or something like that. We interesting do. visualizations, like could you show a little video? Or oh, yeah. Other ways to do high dimensional. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we fiddle with that a little bit. Videos tend to be a little too jumpy, kind of, because the things are too different, but you could, we've nudged, we've fiddled with it. Like we were trying for a while to try and uh, show. Because I, I think, for me at least, you can all you know, uh, confirm or deny. I feel like if you actually attend to peripheral vision, it's kind of a non, it's, it's not static. It, it seems to be switching interpretations or something like that. And, and so we were trying to mimic that for, for a while. And uh, it, Especially a lot of what I'm interested in, what I'm not talking about here, is actually taking this and giving like, advice to how do you design a better uh, information visualization. There you really want like, a visualization of... Like what kind of information is available? Uh, point of view. Um, I mean, some, I, I'm just wondering if you did do some temporal sampling and average several temporal samples of, of these mm -hmm. quirky images, would they look a little less quirky and more like? Uh, uh, they are so different that I think you start to get things that are vastly the wrong statistics, and you you know it doesn't it doesn't look right. If you there's ways of being clever about it by you know sort of half seeding the next sample with the previous one, but noise or something, and then it looks a little bit better. But yeah, and you you had something you had something a long time ago. Push you a little harder on yeah. on the role of the synthesis in your yeah. model. I mean. <laughs> I'm getting mixed messages. Uh, it, it, sounds, it sounds like you're really saying, well, the brain collects these samples, and then what you're making your decision on is actually one of these synthesized things. But when I asked you about that before, you said, no, no, not really. Yeah, well, so, come on, let's, <laughs> right, right. let's have the real well, story. Right? Well, I mean... Or the real fudge. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, so so some of what the fudge is is that I'm reluctant to say things that sound a little too much like the guy in the brain watching the thing on the screen. Uh, but but that said, I mean, you you can in special cases sort of attend to your peripheral vision and see what you th see, and and it. I think that is probably kind of mongrel like. But it might be but, but but you know when you're driving or something like that, I suspect, especially you know when you're not necessarily paying attention. You're making a lot of decisions based on essentially the statistics. You're, you're, you don't need some conscious being to observe the, the synthesis, something like the syntheses. Sorry, I, I go think ahead. the issue about the priors is, is a pretty interesting and important one, and the fact that we don't seem to have sort of conscious experiences of these really totally funky kinds of specific images, Yeah. and, and that that might be an important part of the, the actual answer. Well, so, so certainly, again, this is sort of low-level representation, right? So the priors um, almost certainly come into play in the making the decisions. But I, I just kind of want to be agnostic about whether they come into play in what you think you see. That's just, <laughs> that's, that, that sounds dangerous. <laughs> so I'm trying to think of this idea of a, a bottleneck from a neuroanatomical perspective. And if I were going to point to a bottleneck in, this, in the system, I would point to something like the optic nerve. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's obviously a classic bottleneck, yeah, right? But, I mean, but here, you know, that actually looks like a bottle in a way. Right, right. <laughs> but here we're throwing away far more information than the optic nerve, right? And if it, yeah. what's kind of counterintuitive is mm -hmm. that when you project into the cortex, it expands the dimensionality. So, right, right. So you don't see it. it's a re like a reverse bottleneck when you go in the cortex. Mm -hmm. and so that's where you're suggesting that we're doing this sort of collapsing into like a thousand kind of statistics. And yeah. I'm having a hard time mapping that idea into everything we know about neuroanatomy in the brain. So, so the, the, the way we think of it is the following. So, so certainly there's this, you know, a pretty much of an explosion in V1. And I think the question you have to ask is, suppose that, you, that it's valuable to look for these co-occurrences, right? So valuable that, and, and suppose you didn't have a bottleneck. Well, if you didn't have a bottleneck, you'd look for co-occurrence at every single spatial location and every scale and everything else, right? Think about how much that would explode, what would have to happen in V2 and V4 or whatever. And that doesn't happen, right? That explosion doesn't happen. I mean, I think we, we have sort of back-of-the-envelope calculations that if you did the, the same measurements we're doing, but you didn't, but you actually ma maintained it for each location, you know, subsampled appropriately for the scale and blah, 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 that you'd have at least 100 times as many numbers as we're talk talking about. Um, 
And, uh, and, and of course, it's not literally just 1,000, right? Because you've got 1,000 per pooling <coughs> region, and they overlap. And so, so you know, compared to, uh, compared to the number of receptors or whatever, you don't expect this to be a, a really small number. Compared to V1, you expect it to be uh, a little bit of a small number, but kind of on, this, on that order, right? It's really that the savings is compared to what you could have done if you didn't. If you didn't have a bottleneck, it would have exploded. Yeah. So it seems an implication of the hypothesis would be that foveation on the periphery. Yet the mongolized natural scenes, at least when you're looking at them next to each other, even if you're focusing on the crosshair, they yeah. seem to be very different. Do you have any evidence that actually when if you show them quickly or something that they actually yeah. perceive so, so like I say, we still, especially I'm trying to show color things here because it's, it, they're, they're neater to look at. But um, in color in particular, there's a lot less evidence we can draw on for what happens in color. And as a result, we get a bit more artifacts. And you sort of notice the artifacts when you, uh, when you do this. The, uh, uh, Freeman and Simoncelli are doing uh, stuff with essentially the same model, slightly different way of piecing together pooling regions, same statistics, blah, blah, blah. And they've actually run the experiment. They do um, short presentation times. Uh, you see uh, an original. You, you maintain fixation. You see an original. You see a synthesized. You, you're asked whether the third image was the original or the synthesized. And if you, you know, do the pooling region scaling right and, and you know, all that sort of stuff, people can't, people can't tell the difference. They're bad. Um, so, that's actually, well, at any rate, arguably that, that sort of does a uh, test of sufficiency because your peripheral vision is then, is being applied to the thing that the model has already done, but at any rate, it, it seems, it seems to be a hint. Yeah? Can you scale your pooling regions to be smaller and smaller? Do the, image, do the artifacts go away? Uh, well. I'm trying to think of what the bottle, if we want to make the bottle bigger to make yeah. go away, what exactly are we making bigger? Uh, sorry, if you want to f st stick more information in. Yeah, so we want to slowly but surely make the representation have the artifacts and make it go away. You know, frankly, our artifacts are more like convergence issues of the algorithm than, uh, than anything, I, I believe. Um, but, uh, but it certainly is true that if you, you know, you do smaller and smaller pooling regions, it looks more and more like the original. At some point, it basically you can't easily tell it from the original. That happens smoothly. Uh, well, it's a little hard to answer that because every time you do this again, you get a new sample. And, but yeah, so I'm not sure what the measure of smoothly is, but yeah. I mean, in terms of performance, I, again, I'm, to cite the Freeman and Simoncelli stuff, in terms of performance, that seems to be smooth as you vary the size of the pooling regions, how, how well you do is smooth. Uh, so, yeah. In the search test, did, is there any stereotypy in how hu in where humans actually look during the search test? And do you think that that potentially uh, could be? There's some. Uh, there's two things there, uh, which which actually we're not currently modeling, but it seems to be doing fine without it at the at the moment. Uh, one is you know there's sort of almost sort of ocular motor constraints or something maybe, or, or some people have argued that they're ocular motor constraints. You know, people tend to do smaller saccades rather than larger and things like that. And you can definitely see that kind of stereotypy. Um, in terms of like the way you search, that tends to be much more individual difference like, you know, so um, in a really, really crowded display or something like that, there, there's some people will do this, you know, and other people do this and other people do this, you know, <laughs> um, and, and that's the bane of modeling eye movements and search <laughs> uh, for, for these kind of, these kind of displays, but um. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs>